Good afternoon. Uh, first, I would like to thank ILSI for inviting me to present today, and uh, uh, I'm very happy to find that this year we have more parasite presentations than in the past uh, years of uh, IFP. Uh, this is probably a result of uh, the few outbreaks we have been hearing about, and uh, this morning we had a symposium on cyclospora, and uh, uh, without trying to repeat uh, what we said in the morning, I'm just going to touch a few key elements that I think are critical for us to understand uh, on what's going on with parasites. In the U.S., uh, we are, um, well, not we, but uh, these parasites are the ones that are being uh, followed and investigated. Um, and the reason for that is that, as you can see, uh, most of them, like uh, um, Cryptosporidium uh, and the Giardia, tend to be waterborne, but uh, Cyclospora as well as Trichinella are almost 100% uh, foodborne. In the case of Toxoplasma, we have 50-50 uh, percentage of uh, uh, being foodborne, or there's other ways of transmission that we will talk later. Uh, these parasites don't just present uh, causing illness in humans, but also have a, a financial cost to the health system. We can see that the toxoplasma is one of the most expensive ones, uh, with also a loss of uh, um, uh, quality of life as well as uh, with a high uh, mortality. Uh, this uh, table basically compares uh, the four protozoan parasites. Uh, we have three coccidia, cryptosporidium, cyclospora, and toxoplasma, and of course, giardia. As I mentioned uh, in the prior slide, uh, cryptosporidium as well as giardia are waterborne, but the other ones can be waterborne as well as foodborne. And uh, as we start talking about each one, we're going to see that uh, things get a little more complicated uh, as we talk to in, in this order. With regard to fresh produce, we know that uh, 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 all of them uh, can be transmitted uh, via fresh produce. And uh, in the case of uh, toxoplasma in particular, uh, one of the stages is the one responsible for that. But we also can have the transmission <coughs> via meats. Um, in the case of cyclospora, it doesn't seem to be likely because uh, as of now we know that it's exclusively, uh, seems to infect exclusively to humans. All of them are highly resistant. If we were to put, uh, uh, if we were to rank them in terms of uh, resistance in the environment, of course, uh, cyclospora and toxoplasma will fall into the most resistant ones. And there's uh, some um, properties that uh, will uh, probably uh, explain why they are more resistant morphologically, uh, environmentally. In terms of morphology, we can see uh, these uh, organisms are very small. They can be between, cryptosporidium can be between four to six microns. Uh, cyclospora and toxoplasma are about the same size. Giardia can be between 10 and 14 uh, micrometers. The other thing that is interesting and differentiates uh, cryptosporidium from the other two coccidia is that cyclospora and toxoplasma have a sporocyst. Uh, this is important because that means we have an extra cell wall, not only the cyst wall, but also the sporocyst cell wall, adding another level of uh, protection of the sporozoites, which are the infectious stages of these parasites. In the case of Giardia, the trophozoites are there, and, and Giardia tends to be a little more fragile compared to the other uh, to the other parasites. So uh, in the case of uh, transmission, person-to-person -person transmission, Cryptosporidium and Giardia definitely happens. In the case of Cyclospora, not because it requires more days when the oocysts are excreted to become infectious, and that takes between 10 to 15 days. Pretty much all of them cause, uh, cause gastrointestinal illnesses. Um, in the case of cyclospora, perhaps one of the best uh, recognized characteristics, even if an individual seems to be asymptomatic, is the presence of anorexia. Uh, of course, the treatment for all of those, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, all of them can be foodborne and waterborne. In the case of Giardia, the trophozoite, there's been a lot of studies, molecular studies, and trying to classify, classify them into different species and genotypes. We know uh, that there's uh, 
the zoonotic types A and B that can infect humans as well as other animal species. There's other types of giardia that can infect animals but are not of public health relevance. Uh, one of the characteristics of Giardia is that it doesn't really penetrate uh, the intestinal epithelia. It just uh, um, deposits on top. And uh, uh, what's interesting about this, this organism is that it's capable of causing all of these uh, gastrointestinal symptoms without having to really penetrate the cells. The infectious dose is very low, like with all of these other organisms. It can be asymptomatic, but when when diarrhea comes, you can you will know that it's there. Uh, the parasite can survive in the host using several mechanisms. One of them that is the most fascinating one. I spent a good amount of time uh, learning about the antigenic variation of this parasite, and basically, what it is is that uh, if uh, one variant is infecting the host, the host will develop antibodies against this variant. So what the parasite does is basically switches the antigens on the surface. So the, the host no longer recognizes it and has to develop completely a new set of antibodies, a new set of uh, immune responses to be able to control that uh, population. So this uh, mouse and cat uh, chase can happen for um, uh, several cycles, and all depends on the host immune response uh, the, of the host. Uh, it can survive in different conditions in the intestine as well as in the environment, and it's very well known to cause malabsorption in, in humans. Uh, as I mentioned, there's no intracellular phase, and uh, uh, basically what it does, it uh, yeah, it, it affects the tight junctions of the cells of the intestine, and therefore there's uh, an increased permeability, and uh, this will result in diarrhea. Cryptosporidium is the other parasite. It's a coccidia, um, four to six microns. Again, as I mentioned, uh, produces the sporozoites, four sporozoites per oocyst. And the early studies of cryptosporidium in the 1980s and uh, 1990s, uh, cryptosporidium was considered to be one single species, uh, parvum, the one that affected humans and animals. But as time uh, went by and more morphological as well as uh, uh, genetic testings were done, we identified that uh, it was not just cattle the one responsible for it, but there were other species. This is the case that uh, parvum, ominis, and meliagridis, they infect humans. Ominis and parvum are the most uh, uh, commonly isolate, uh, found in, uh, causing illness in humans. But there's other, other cryptosporidium that are not uh, infectious to humans. Uh, uh, but again, they're important as we start talking about foods because the fact that we identify cryptosporidium in foods, uh, that's not enough. We need to determine what kind of a species or what kind of genotype it is and to determine whether they are, they are of any public health relevance. There's other species that infect other animals that can also cause infection in humans. Here's a list of uh, different types of foods that have been um, described having cryptosporidium. In some cases, you can, uh, well, you can see there are a number of cases that have uh, um, people have, that had uh, cryptosporidiosis uh, due to the consumption of those foods, as well as vegetables, uh, apple cider. We've had a few cases, uh, two outbreaks of apple cider. And, uh, but what's uh, interesting for me is this particular slide and also raises the issue of well, what if you find something? What does it really mean for the food industry? Uh, we know that uh, shellfish can concentrate oocysts from water, uh, so, uh, sea water as well as fresh water. Uh, we know that these organisms are viable, but uh, we haven't really heard about outbreaks of cyclospora associated with consumption of shellfish. So what does it really mean? We know they are potentially dangerous, but um, Again, it's whether, well, uh, do we need to really treat these shellfish, cook them properly in order to prevent the transmission? How about people that like to eat uh, oysters raw? Are they at higher risk than others? And why haven't we heard about uh, outbreaks of cryptosporidium with, associated with shellfish? Um, the, one of the advantages this morning, we were talking about cryptosporidium and how hard it is now, it's to do traceback studies and 
uh, with the, with Cryptospor with Cyclospora. Well, with Cryptosporium, there's been a lot of work done, and the reason for that is that Cryptosporium is mostly waterborne, so there's been a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, support to develop these tools. So uh, these tools have been used in several foodborne outbreaks, um, food handlers uh, uh, implicated in foodborne outbreaks, uh, very nice studies done uh, mostly by uh, Dr. Xiao at CDC. Uh, but the, so that's something that we have positive now uh, in the case of Cryptosporidium, however, um, we can see them in locations, not in the U.S., but in developing areas, uh, developing countries. When these infections occur with cryptosporidium, repeated infections, there can be, uh, um, uh, the effect could be the stunting in, child in children as well as uh, um, not uh, an ideal cognitive development of these children. This parasite is unlike Giardia. Giardia just sits on top of the microvilli. In the case of Giardia, it penetrates, but again, it's, uh, it's outside the um, cytoplasm. And uh, what's fascinating about this parasite, it has developed some strategies to prevent, um, to avoid the host immune response. And uh, not only that, but also has some um, enzymes that actually prevent from any from some drugs to actually act on the DNA of these parasites. So if there is an attack, the parasite, what it does, it continues producing its DNA using salvage enzymes. In the case of Cyclospora, uh, again, it's a coccidia. Here you can see the, sp the sporulated oocyst and the unsporulated oocyst. It's autofluorescent. And this coccidia actually penetrates the cells. So you can see in this, uh, in this picture how there's a lot of uh, um, intracellular stages of the parasite, uh, stage one and stage two of the merons. And in the, um, in the slide at the bottom, you can see um, uh, transmission electron micrographs of the um, uh, merozoites. Toxoplasma is the other coccidian parasite. And this one gets more complicated. So. The first uh, three uh, basically can infect the gastrointestinal uh, tract. Some of them have been reported to infect the respiratory tract. Uh, but in the case of Toxoplasma, things get a little more complicated. CAT is the definite uh, host and plays a significant role in the, the survival of this parasite. The transmission can happen uh, when the all um, cysts uh, are excreted in the feces of the cat and mice or any other animal species ingest that, including, of course, if uh, vegetables or water is contaminated with cat feces, of course, human can, humans can acquire the infection. There's different types of uh, strains, clonal lineages, and again, there's been a lot of work being done on this parasite, uh, trying to understand why, in some instances, the illness is more severe than in other ones. Uh, toxoplasmosis can be acquired with, uh, by ingesting undercooked meat, and uh, the tissue cysts of this parasite are present in this meat, and uh, those are called the bradyzoites. They are slow-multiplying organisms that uh, are very resistant. Uh, but it also can be acquired by uh, drinking or eating contaminated foods that had uh, cat feces containing the oocysts. There's been a few outbreaks of uh, water, particularly in Brazil and in Canada. And uh, uh, we don't know what's the significance of uh, uh, produce in this uh, transmission. It looks very logical that, that uh, produce would be another uh, source of contamination. Uh, we know it's a very, very important parasite in humans. And the issue with this organism is that uh, in most instances, it's uh, asymptomatic. We cannot, people don't get sick. But uh, the most affected ones are AIDS patients who are immunocompromised, as well as uh, females who are pregnant, that can, the baby can uh, get infected, or the fetus can get infected, and there can be some abortion or stillbirths. Or, children uh, or babies are born with uh, congenital uh, toxoplasmosis. Again, it's a leading cause of uh, uh, death associated, associated to foodborne illness. It's a, a, a cause of uh, hospitalizations, 
and uh, uh, now it's considered one of the neglected parasitic diseases in, uh, in the U.S. As I mentioned, cats play a major role in toxoplasma transmission. Uh, we really don't know how many cats are in the U.S. Uh, and how many cats are really infected with toxoplasma. We know that uh, there's about uh, 73 million feral cats in the U.S. and uh, 78 million domestic cats. It's estimated to be one third of the households in the U.S. has a cat. And uh, uh, there is, uh, of course, the definite hosts, and they can acquire the infection by ingesting rodents, uh, birds, any creatures that are uh, outside in the outdoors. Uh, but uh, these cats, domestic cats, could be controlled. But uh, the problem is that uh, there's vaccines, but uh, they didn't get much uh, attention. Toxoplasma can survive uh, for long periods of time at different temperatures. You can see 334 days at 6 to 36 degrees. It can resist uh, freezing. And uh, there's some treatments that are having uh, um, related to uh, that can work with toxoplasma. One of the things that I wanted to show you uh, with regard to resistance is the cyst wall. Uh, we can see here that cryptosporidium uh, has a suture, which is uh, can be very easily open apart, and that's how, how the sporozoites come out. In the case of uh, toxoplasma, which is the one in the right, um, it has a double cell wall. And uh, again, it's highly resistant, as well as uh, cyclospora, which is at the very bottom. Uh, it's highly resistant to inactivation, uh, cryptosporidium. Uh, we have giardia and we have cyclospora there. We know that uh, there is there. At, this, at least at these conditions, they are highly resistant, but as we go to higher temperatures, they can be uh, eliminated. They also can be, uh, in the case of cryptosporidium, uh, we can tell that there is some kind of uh, inactivation at different conditions of alcohol concentrations as well as uh, sugar concentrations. There's different, different chemicals that we have tested, and they all have uh, some kind of level of uh, resistant or uh, but uh, they don't work as well as when we look at bacteria. In the case of cyclosporas, same thing. We know that chlorine dioxide doesn't really work. We know that some of the chemicals uh, really don't work on cyclosporas. So we're really looking for something to, to, con to kill uh, these parasites. Um, freezing is good for all of these organisms. And uh, here we have other types of chemicals to, uh, for inactivation. Uh, when it comes to prevention, it's very critical to watch out for the water quality for irrigation, the soil, the type of composting, uh, the field workers, and of course, uh, the hand washing. Uh, it's very, very important. Uh, one of the critical parts with parasites is that we don't have an enrichment step. So whatever testing, whatever that has to be done with this parasite, it has to be with what can be isolated from this, and it's crucial to determine that the other thing is that is important is that the presence of the organism doesn't mean that they are viable. And the fact that they're viable doesn't mean that they're infectious. So that's something very different as well as we look at other uh, foodborne pathogens. And the other organism that today we're going to be talking about is uh, Trichinella. Trichinella has been in the U.S. coming and going. And, and we are seeing this more frequently now that uh, people go and do um, ga uh, go hunting and uh, consume game meat. But anyways, uh, Trichinella spiralis is usually found in, in, the, uh, in the pigs, but uh, the transmission goes uh, by consumption. The, the pig consum consuming animals that are contaminated, and uh, this one, when the human ingests this meat with the worms, basically it will multiply in the intestine and produce small larvae. This larva will migrate to different parts of the body and then it will produce uh, different types of uh, uh, clinical presentation. This presentation will depend on the host immunity and the age and, of course, the general health of the individual. Uh, prevention basic basically means uh, preventing the animals, the pigs, to be in contact with wildlife, no rodents, and to protect the meat. There's different species of uh, trichinella that have been identified infecting humans. Uh, perhaps the, um, the one with the uh, trichinella nativa is one of the ones that are hurt most because of the consumption of bears. 
Uh, here's the clinical presentation, but uh, in the first step, the enteral phase is diarrhea, gastrointestinal, but then it goes to different parts of the body and can uh, present uh, um, uh, more uh, severe present, uh, illness. So what we need to learn? Uh, we need to learn a lot about the, continue learning more about the ecology, reservoirs, particularly cyclospora. Uh, find out measures to avoid introduction of these parasites in ready-to-eat food. We need more work to identify treatments that can activate these parasites and um, improve environmental sampling. As I said, we cannot enrich these uh, this, uh, um, samples, so we need to work with what we have. In the case of trichinella, it's very important, the education of the producers and consumers, um, as that infection can really be controlled. And of course, uh, find a very an effective inactivation strategies to use in fresh products. That's all I had to tell you. My other colleagues will be talking to you about uh, epidemiology and other cool stuff. Do you have any other questions for me?